Hello, everyone. On behalf of the GEO Institute, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the webinar, The Digital Library of the Future. At the outset, I would like to thank you all for engaging with us, even during such uncertain times. We are delighted to have participants from 29 states and union territories of India, as well as from 18 different countries around the world, join us for this webinar. Once again, a warm welcome to you all. In light of India's significant digital potential, as well as the vast number of educational and research institutions around the country, the nature, nurture, as well as culture of information ecosystems are on the cusp of a paradigm shift. Digital libraries are at the forefront of this change. They have the potential of integrating content from myriad sources and provide a robust and seamless environment for information cycles. In many ways, the future of research and scholarship depends on how much we galvanize such platforms while ensuring quality as well as contextual relevance. In this webinar, we hope to give you a glimpse of this potential and subsequently engage with you all to discuss pathways and obstacles in this process. As we transition towards a digital library architecture, we hope this webinar can act as a catalyst to initiate conversations and collaborations to facilitate the same. I request all participants to submit your questions, if any, in the Q&A panel at the earliest. We will try and cover as many questions as possible during the course of this webinar. Please ensure that your questions are as concise as possible. Before we begin the session, I would like to request Dr. Palak Shade, Project Director, to give a brief overview about the GEO Institute. Thank you, Sanchayan. Uh, on behalf of GEO Institute, I extend very warm, very warm welcome to Michael Keller, Vice Provost and Chief University Librarian, Stanford University, and Tom Kramer, Chief Technologist and Director of Digital Libraries at Stanford University. I would also like to welcome all the participants to this webinar at GEO Institute. We have almost 2,500 plus registration for this webinar. 1,100 plus participants are from the library profession. This has been also represented by 16 Institute of Eminence in India and represented by 29 states of India and 19 countries globally. Next, this is just a, a data that how this uh, almost 2300 participants were distributed among the 29 states and union territories are from. Next. These are the 19 countries that has been represented in today's webinar participants. Next. We have also a very diverse group represented by industry, government, academia, civil society and startup, which is part of today's participant list. We have also large community of library science professional, which has been represented today, almost 1100 plus. So we welcome all of you to this webinar on digital libraries today. Next. So I would like to start uh, by sharing the vision of chairman and chairperson of Reliance Foundation, who have decided to dedicate the rest of life for empowering, empowering youth of India. As a part of this vision, GEO Institute is conceived as an exemplary institution to develop a stronger research and innovation ecosystem for higher education in India. Next. The vision of GEO Institute is to build a research university with the multidisciplinary schools in it. As a part of this, GEO Institute is envisaged as a world-class uni research university for the nation development. GEO Institute will become a world-class platform for research and innovation with focus on solving India's problem and solving it fast. It will also take, take up global challenges in due course and contribute to make a world as a better place. GEO Institute is committed to prepare the next generation leaders and entrepreneurs as a part of their graduates. Next. GEO Institute with help of chairman and the Global Connect of Reliance Industries Limited invited globally renowned thought leaders from the higher education and former president of renowned university to provide guidance to build a strong pillar of academic excellence, 
industry relevance and social significance to develop academic program research center and building an innovation ecosystem for geo institute next geo institute plans to begin its academic program by offering a two masters program from july 2021 we shall offer masters in artificial intelligence and data science and masters in digital media and marketing communication from july 2021 we are also exploring to offer a phd and postdoc program in alliance with international institution we are also plan to develop a center of excellence in the areas of ai for health ai for agriculture and ai for retail next jio institute is developing its initial campus at a new mumbai a place called ulve the campus will be spread across 52 acre area while it launch first two program in to july 2021 ulve is a very strategic location which will be around 10 minutes away from the new mumbai airport that is under construction and the new ceiling which will be connecting south mumbai and new mumbai the jio institute next jio institute has already initiated recruitment of its academic leadership faculty and staff next jio institute has also taken an initiative to build a digital library along with launching its academic program dr michael keller and tom kramer both from the stanford university are helping and guiding us to build this jio digital library jio institute wanted to build a research library that advance its mission of academic research and innovation hence jio library will also have a multidisciplinary team from the library science professional and subject expert who will facilitate the geo researchers advancement of their research mission geo institute also uh, aspire to develop a special collection and archive section to create a new knowledge for the india as an example we are very keen to develop an archive section for the for the history of mumbai which will become a demonstration archive for any library for india next jio institute has also started its outreach activities by bringing global scholars and thought leaders to india as a part of this we are conducting today's webinar with dr michael keller and tom uh, kramer from stanford university the objective of today's webinar is to demonstrate potential of digital library and broaden the horizon to unleash the unlimited possibility and opportunity for indian library system with this i would conclude my briefing about jio institute and it is over to you mike thank you very much mike you will need to unmute Tom, can you call Mike? He's on mute. Thank you, Palak Bai, for that yeah. introduction to the wonderful collaboration we from Stanford are experiencing with our colleagues from the Geo Institute in developing the world-class institution of research and instruction it will become. Our focus is on the Geo Library and the Geo Digital Library, of course. Tom Kramer, my colleague at Stanford, and I will make this presentation regarding the trends in digital library services and collections. As you will learn from our presentation, the role of digital libraries in advanced research and instruction has increased in importance and functionality in recent years. Those advances will continue in part by improvements in technology, but also and most importantly through collaboration so that, that a rising tide in one place or one domain will affect all the boats in other places and domains. Ease of access to the published literature of scholarship has been improving for some time. To that, we are adding access to primary resources from ancient and medieval manuscripts to current data sets. Technical approaches to support uh, analysis and communication by research teams around the earth are now well supported including minute descriptions or comments on aspects of such resources 
uh, as we are presenting. We call these annotations. In addition, more or less automated functions in the realm of scholarly communication, including digital preservation for communication to generations of students and scholars not yet born, are underway and successful. We are concerned as well with engineering our services and access to scholarly resources in ways to reduce friction and make less time consuming such access. Another exciting trend made easy by technologies you will see in this presentation involve the contributions made possible on specific and locally defined exhibits of locally available resources or the scholarly synthesis arising from study groups from many places simultaneously promoting understanding and appreciation in cultural and scientific topics. As you will see, much of the future will depend upon more easy and extensive collaboration, both internal to an institution, among work groups, and external with colleagues far and wide around the globe. We present many such collaborations and some pointers to the future through those examples. Building a research library is accomplished over many years, invokes many good minds working together. Building a research library draws in external partners from commercial sectors, as well as other research organizations. As you will see, we stand on one another's shoulders to advance the common causes of educating the leaders and citizens of tomorrow in the widest range of domains. We also model for those future leaders the fundamental significance and training to engage in lifelong learning. The role of public libraries in the past centuries has been as a vehicle for such ongoing self-improvement. Now, digital libraries support formal, matriculated instruction, as well as the practice by individuals of selecting relevant information, knowledge, and wisdom through the exercise of good judgment learned in places like the Geo Institute, then using those new increments of understanding in support of careers, communities, companies, and most importantly, the development of the next generation of citizens. Digital libraries will provide frictionless services, access to distributed collections around the earth, and new modes of discovery, study, and analysis based on collection and modeling, then on widespread adoption and ad adaptation. Much of this presentation is from the Stanford Library's perspective, but you will see numerous examples of collaboration, which in each case has enriched innovation of the parties involved in these projects. We regard what we will present as a collection of models, not merely for adoption, but for adaptation to local needs on the one hand, and for improvement, either by building on what has been done or by suggestions for improvements. Let me start by some demonstrations from the Stanford Library's programs, then move to specific collaborations. Tom Kramer will follow on my recitation with further examples of relevant developments. Let us pause here and take a look at some of the characteristics of the Stanford Libraries. Most importantly on this uh, slide, I direct your attention to the middle bullet in, uh, entitled staff. The staff are the core of making a, gr a good library a great library. We have 210 professionals and 210 pr paraprofessional staff. Of the 148 librarians, about 40 of them are subject specialists and a great many others are technical specialists. Some in the, in the technical processing, acquisitions, cataloging, preservation of library materials, and a great many involved with our subject specialists in building these frictionless, more or less frictionless services that help improve teaching and instruction, excuse me, instruction and research at Stanford. Next slide, please. Next. Today, we're going to look at some examples. I'm gonna go back, please. We're gonna look at examples from the Stanford Libraries. If you don't mind, I'm now going to switch over to sh share my screen so we can go on this journey together. Thanks, Tom, I'm, here I come. Uh, okay, I'm trying to do this, share, okay. Now, here is the homepage of the Stanford Libraries. You'll see that we have an alert because we're ch we've changed some of our activities due to this COVID uh, virus problem that we have. Let me start on this journey 
by entering the term Gandhi and searching on it in this simple search box, you will see arising several uh, boxes in this result page. We call this the bento box approach. Let me increase the resolution here so you can see some of what I'm tr trying to demonstrate. Here uh, in our catalog, you'll see we have 40, almost 4,800 results with the term Gandhi somewhere in the bibliographic record. I'm going to show you how we can reduce that very large set to a smaller set. Here's, here are the, some of the records, the first of the records, but I want to draw your attention to these panels on the left, which show, uh, show how to reduce this set, 4797, to a more manageable uh, limit. And I now click on access, so you can see we offer these choices to reduce the set. We'll leave all of these present at the time. We could select resource types. Uh, I, will, I will select book. And uh, we, could we could select media type, but I'm not going to use that. I am going to make use of the date setting, and I'm going to draw that over to the last decade or so because there's something very specific I need to show you. Finally, we could select uh, from our many, many libraries. Here they all are. But I'm going to let this stay open for all of our libraries at the moment. In terms of language and for my ease, I'm going to reduce the set down to something like 3407 in uh, in English, but you see we have other languages represented in this collection. Finally, with regard to author, I'm going to leave this open. And instead, I'm going to, uh, we could look at the, the various classifications. I don't need to do that. Under topic, I'm going to select um, Hinduism, which is down here. That will reduce it to 29 catalog results. And I'm going to then take a look at these 29, now that we came down from almost 4,800 to 29 in just a few minutes. And I want to show you one in particular that has the, uh, that has the um, characteristics I'm interested in. Let me see here. Where is that one? Here, here it is. Narasinha Mehta of Gujarat, a legacy of bhakti in songs and stories. Let me bring up that record so we can look at it together in, in whole. Here, as you see my cursor surrounding, is the basic uh, bibliographic information. Here are the, the sorts of record uh, entries you might find in a typical record. But following that is some information we have purchased from the Nielsen Book Data people. In the first uh, segment are, is essentially the table of contents of this work. And then down here is a, a textual summary of what is in this book. What this in effect does is increase the number of words that our searchers here at Stanford, and indeed you too, can, can use to find out, uh, records of uh, books that are of interest. It's a, it increases the number of characters and words from this very tiny set here to a great many uh, down here. Going further, you'll see that we show three subjects here. I'll come back to that in another piece. Here is a virtual book plate because we purchased this book with money from an endowment in support of religious studies. Down here is a view of this work, this work with a red panel at the bottom, which is the book in question, and a kind of virtual shelf list. We created this in order to provide the ability for serendipitous browsing. We train our students when they come to a shelf to look on the shelf itself and then to look up and down the shelves to see whether there are other books of interest to their research. Finally, and coming back up here, I want to show you that we have, in this case, the book available from Oxford Scholarship Online. And this causes me to remember that I didn't log in. You'll excuse me for a minute while I present my credentials to my own system. <laughs> here we go. Here we go, here we go, here we go. And I need to go here, and I need to go here. I'm going to enter a passcode, which changes every few seconds. And I'm logged in. I'm authenticated as a member of the Stanford uh, community. So now, because this is a licensed resource, I can easily go to Oxford Scholarship Online and 
in the fullness of time. The book will show up, I hope. Yes, here it is. And we can go and read this book. I'm just going to select a page over here, page 15, and hit go. And there we are, reading the book. Now, back here, I wanted to show you one other feature, which we think is uh, very important because our collection is very big. As you saw, it's over 10 million volumes, physical volumes, and over uh, 2.5 million eBooks. If we call up this map, can you see it? I hope you can see it. I mean, enlarge it a bit. You can see where this red carrot is right here, that we have um, the book identified in our map of our stacks. So the reader doesn't have to go uh, tromping around the library to find the book. Okay, so now let's go back and check out the same topic in, uh, I have to start all over again, sorry. Here we go. We'll get the same search going. And this time we'll go over here to what we call Articles Plus in which there are 432,810 results, a huge number. So we'll figure out how to sort through that. And Articles Plus, I should tell you, is based on the bibliographic file that we licensed from the EBSCO company. And we've put on it a front end, as we have with our online catalog, of a Blacklight application, a free uh, environment, very well suited to serving libraries. And, um, uh, I'm going to bring up these 432,000 results while I'm talking. And we get the opportunity to reduce these very large sets to manageable smaller sets. So um, with this approach, I'm going to once again select the date range and reduce the date range to about 20 years. Let me just get that precisely set. There we go, more or less. And uh, I'm going to... In addition, uh, pick a source type. In this case, it'll be academic journals. We are, after all, academics. And that is coming in. So we've gone from 432 to 126,000, still a huge number. I'm going to uh, select English again. We'll get it down a little bit further. And that's underway. Okay, now I'm going to, uh, I've done the language, I'm going to enter under topic, um, I'm going to enter under topic Mahatma Gandhi, which will take it down to just under a thousand entries. And having done that, I'm going to go back to topic and add another topic which will be education. We're all in the business of education. That seems appropriate to me. So once again, we've reduced this set very quickly, very quickly, without knowing anything much about the, about the, uh, the subjects that we're interested in, in terms of actually knowing uh, the contents of our collection. And I'm gonna show you something of interest uh, down here. This one, number six. So if I select this one, I can just click on this full text business and down will come the article itself because we've used a link resolver with that EBSCO discovery service uh, bibliographic file on which we put the blacklight front end to get to this title, very, this article very quickly. And you want, one can just read the whole article. Okay, so now, I want to show you one more, a couple more things in our website that I hope you will find interesting. And here we are back to the bento box. We'll go down here to the library website. It's, it's tens of thousands of pages, so it is important to, for us to be able to search it. But I can see something right here on this home, this page in this library website box that there's something that's of great interest to me. This is actually a press release about a project that we are supporting that was developed and uh, is operating through UC Berkeley, but they came to us to get the job done. And as you see, there's a link 
to unheard stories, our oral history videos uh, that are available online. So I take this down here, I select the term English, and we see uh, the first oral history uh, that will be a video, and now I click on this uh, to get this uh, video showing to you and to me uh, from a woman who speaks English. And I just wanted to show you to this. crossed the border right after it was announced that the partition has taken place. The day they heard, there was a little radio, I remember them all around. Okay. Now, a little more complicated demonstration I need to do. You now can see, of course, that we can do media materials in this environment very easily, too. This is a widget from a company called You Know that is uh, licensed to us a discovery environment based on concepts, not on keywords and key phrases. This is a product of a friend of mine who uses AI, machine learning, and many other algorithms to create um, this repertory of concepts and then the ability to display them their relationships among one another, and documents that bear those concepts. So this is a simple graph. And let me show you uh, the relationships between uh, these, these concepts that are displayed in this simple graph. So let me take uh, this one right here. Uh, it's a little trouble to get, there we go. So if I click on this, you can see the shared concepts down here between the two ideas, the idea of Mahatma Gandhi and the idea of Vinayak Damodar Savarkar. One of the elements that I find most interesting in this, these shared concepts is the Indian independence uh, movement. And I want to expand that con concept as a second large concept in this general realm here. These are shared concepts between Mahatma Gandhi and the Indian independence movement. There don't seem to be enough elements showing, enough concepts showing. So with that pull down on the right, I am able to call up a lot more uh, concepts. So I've done the Indian independence. I'm now looking for a particular problem that arose. And it is a massacre that occurred. Let me see if I can find it. Yes, here it is down here. Right here. So if I click on the Yalanwala Bach massacre, you'll see that we get an entry over here with the brief description of what it's about, the concepts that are inherent in it, great many of them, and documents that contain that concept and are relevant to it. So I'm going to click right here on Empire Soldier, Gandhi and Britain's War, published some time ago, and we will first get links, again using this link resolver approach, and we eventually get to the table of contents, and then we get, easily enough, the article in question. There it is. So this was all done on the basis of concepts, not on the basis of keywords and key phrases. We got there quickly, and I will tell you that I am not, I am not a, a brilliant, scholar of your history. I am appreciative of your history, but I am not a brilliant scholar of it. I want now to do one more search in this arena, and I'm going to start afresh by entering a new concept that I've just invented in my head, and I'm gonna be looking for brain tumors, just to show you that science is here. Oh, here's a concept that we can click on. It's one in the repertory of concepts that the people that you know have developed, and I'm going to increase the number of concepts showing, and I'm looking for glioblastoma multiform. Very quickly, the letters are quite small, I, I can tell you. Well, of course, I can expand that, can't I? Somewhat. Let me just add a concept to, uh, to speed this along. I'm going to add the concept glioblastoma multiform. There it is. I add that, and I make it into a second concept. And now you see many shared, many shared um, uh, concepts. And I need to expand that because there's one in particular that I want to show you that I know is here if I can find it. And let's see here. Uh, ba ba ba. Where is it? It's a pediatric. Um, it's a pediatric. Uh, 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 
I'm looking, uh, where is it? Oh, here it is. Pediatric ependymoma. This is a, this is something that's very well studied. Now, here are the concepts in this particular uh, uh, concept that are, that describe relationships, but I'm going to go to these documents and I want to bring up this first one so you can see it. Once again, we go swiftly to the article and I'm clicking now on EBSCOhost Academic Search Premier that enables this link to this article. Here's the link and here's the article. Okay, now <coughs> we go back to the library's homepage and over here under collections, I wanna show you, essentially I'm gonna show you three exhibits, uh, two right away and then one uh, in a minute or two. Here is one that we just brought up in the last year. It's an, it's a, an exhibit on traditional jazz in San Francisco. It turns out the term jazz was first used in the early 20th century in San Francisco. This is a collaboration between Stanford Libraries and the San Francisco Traditional Jazz Foundation. Here's the entry, and excuse me if this uh, sound is a little bit loud. <laughs> Well, the most important thing about the San Francisco Traditional Jazz Archive here at Stanford University is the legacy that it, that it, it represents. The musicians who tirelessly dedicated their lives to it have been underappreciated in the world of music. So that's one. Now let me take you to another one that lies in this expose. It's entitled Tokyo Over Time. This is a collection of maps from our David Rumsey Map Center collection, historic maps that have been uh, digitized in very high resolution. And we provided these to a conference in Tokyo about a year ago um, that uh, has been uh, uh, illustrative of the growth and change in Tokyo over time. Let me show you how we can expand this map. And I'm going to expand the view to boot. So you can see, oh, let me raise this up. You can see in great detail Tokyo in the early, um, uh, late 18th, early 19th century, down to individual structures on streets. This is a good example of what we can do with both digitization and georectification. So now let me turn to uh, a collaboration we did with the Vatican Library in which they took about 18,000 manuscripts that were the most heavily used one in scholarship since the founding of this library, this version of the Vatican Library in 1451. And in particular, I wanna show you something from the Library of a Humanist Prince. This uh, exhibit depends upon blacklight again, but also in a, in a way more importantly, the possibilities of something called the International Image Interoperability Framework and the Mirador browser, uh, both started at Stanford, and that's, that Tom will demonstrate to you more thoroughly in the coming segment. I wanna show you annotations because I believe annotations are incredibly important. We'll go to the first manuscript and the first manuscript page is coming up. And in this, you will see these geometric circles in white, which are uh, circles that were put in there by the curator of this exhibit and they can be put uh, on any, uh, any uh, manuscript or any newspaper or any photograph. And each of them has a little annotation explaining what's on them. This is St. David playing his harp. This is uh, the, the table of uh, laws uh, from M Moses. This is uh, Solomon, the great uh, prophet. This is uh, the, the heraldry of the the man who collected these books. Here's a little uh, uh, illustrated, uh, decorated initial, et cetera, et cetera. So these annotations can be shared. They can be created by one person or by a, by a seminar, and they can be shared around the world. And when this image goes back 
to the server at the Vatican, thanks to the downstreaming uh, feature of the IIIF technologies, none of these annotations remain. However, when the user who created these annotations brings them back, they return as though they were part of the manuscript, though in fact, they're really not. So this is a great collaboration and it's led to another one. And once again, I go back to the Stanford Library's homepage very quickly. And I'm gonna reduce this in size a bit so you can see what I'm up to. Over here at Collections, I go quickly back to Online Exhibits, and I'm gonna bring up one of our earliest projects which has totally changed the practice of medieval and early modern studies by some of the features that we put in place. And very quickly, let me show you how this works. I'm searching for an image of elephants in any of these 558 manuscripts from the 6th century to the early 16th century. And here we go down here at the Matthew Paris Chronicle Maiora, a chronicle of the world that was uh, written by Matthew Paris in the 13th century. And you will see this image of an elephant. Beautiful. We can expand this image so you can actually see very easily the text of this manuscript. And indeed, you can see that this is the skin side of the vellum, not the hair side. Let me bring this back out a little bit and now navigate up. Whoops, excuse me, I gotta do that with the technology, not with my, we're gonna navigate up to see how close we can come. Uh, bring this up, come on, come on. Here we go. Now you look at the pen strokes and the brush strokes in this manuscript. About 95% of what a, a manuscript scholar would want to investigate, he can investigate or she can investigate using this sort of approach. Let me also show you something uh, very much in the, in the order of making things frictionless. Here's the front page uh, or the inside page of the manuscript, the description of it and so forth. But we've, we've created a bibliography of works about this manuscript or modern editions of this manuscript and created a bibliography of this very manuscript. And here it is. It's very extensive and we add to it as we go along. So this is a great new way of showing the literature of one manuscript or one sculpture or one whatever that makes easy uh, progress in scholarship. Finally, I, I have a little uh, description of something that I think will be important, but I do not have a display for you. A collaboration that we're engaged in now with a number of institutions is called Link Data for Production. We're in the third year of that grant, and we've had about two dozen other institutions involved with us that are making use of linked open data, resource description framework triples, to describe various parameters of anything, books, ideas, people, places, events, and so forth. In the third stage of this grant, we're beginning to figure out how to apply this approach, not just to discovery, which is pretty good, actually it's excellent, but also business practices and libraries. This is a big development. It will speed discovery, but it'll also make more easy the management of data about our collections and how we build them. There is an, there is an example of a discovery environment that uh, has been created in cooperation with the folks at Casalini Libri in Fiesole, Italy. The discovery environment is called SHARE-VDE, SHARE Virtual Discovery Environment. When you review this um, presentation, you should go to https colon slash slash www.share-vde.org. This is a peek at the coming environment, the, a, a trend that will be very important to discovery, not just of library resources, but also of resources and archives, museums, the popular press, and the web in general. For a brilliant precursor, go to the Bibliothèque Nationale de France and see its linked database discovery environment for information about its holdings gathered from bibliographic records, catalogs, finding aids, etc., created over the past two centuries. It is data.bnf.fr, an open data project based on semantic web standards and tools. Go to https colon slash slash data.bnf.fr.
www.ncpa.fr. Thanks very much. I now turn this over to my colleague and friend, Tom Kramer. Thank you, Mike. And you release the screen share. I'll uh, resume. Trying to get there. <laughs> there we go. It's over to you. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, Mike has talked a little bit about uh, the overall importance and trends in research libraries and digital libraries and giving you a hands-on tour. I'm going to discuss uh, some of the digital library services and infrastructure that makes up those services and makes these things possible. I'm seeing lots of questions about uh, what types of software we use and how do we make some of the things that Mike just demonstrated possible. And I hope this section of the presentation gives you some more information on that. First. Um, there are uh, three major trends that we think of uh, when we're building digital libraries. Um, that one, we want to consider all formats of information, uh, not just books, not just journals, not just images, but all of them together. Second is we're very engaged and uh, focused on supporting the full life cycle of information. So not just discovery and delivery, as Mike has shown, uh, but also uh, analysis, authoring, uh, even digitization and the preservation of materials. Uh, we're quite focused on collaborations and joint action and partnership. We believe this is a, an area where libraries and higher education um, can lead the world. And fourth, I'll give you some more case studies that highlight some of the features I've talked about and reinforce what Mike has shown. So, to begin with, um, the digital library, just like a physical library really, um, is more than just the objects within the library. So we think of uh, the digital library as three intersecting services, or three intersecting spheres of, of concern. What first is content. Uh, obviously you need the materials for people to read uh, or consult. Second is a set of services. Digital information is actually not useful unless you have applications to make use of it. Third is both content and services require substantial amounts of uh, digital infrastructure. So the other, those are items such as identifiers and resolvers, uh, but also the ability to do authentication and authorization to those services. And of course, your data center environment, the server storage and network. To reinforce the point. Um, well, Tom, can you be a little louder? Yes, I can. Thank you. Thanks, Pollock. Uh, let me know if this isn't loud enough. Uh, so uh, a digital library today is not just about a single format of information. It is about all different types of information that any researcher or scholar or student may be engaged with in the course of their studies and scholarship. So we look at theses and dissertations, books, articles, images, audiovisual materials, increasingly focused on data and software, maps, ge geographic information systems, primary source documents such as PDFs or Word documents, and increasingly we're looking at data harvested straight from the web, including websites. Uh, second, as I mentioned, we're focused on services. So it's not enough just to read them, we're focused on building out systems that support the digitization of, of materials, their deposit into a managed environment, the ability to describe, license, and control access. Uh, we're also a major focus of our digital libraries are long-term preservation of the objects that we bring in. We're focused not just on the next three years or the five years, but the next 30, 50, and 100. The materials that we have today should all be available to the scholars of tomorrow. Publication is an increasingly important function, especially in the digital realm and libraries through their services are in, in becoming almost publishing agents as they allow scholars to put their materials online in a controlled and reputable environment and make them available as part of the scholarly communications process to other researchers. And Mike's just shown great examples of uh, new forms of discovery, delivery of multimedia materials, and the ability not just to get these materials, but to analyze, uh, study, and mark them up. A third major trend which we think uh, uh, digital libraries are really driving is that of community. So we do not collect uh, in isolation. We do not build our services in isolation. 
uh, and we don't undertake initiatives in isolation. In all of these cases, we are focused on community, collaboration, and partnership. Many of, many of these partnerships take the form of open source software or open data. Can we produce and surface data that enrich the studies and collections of other libraries? And at the same time, can they reciprocate by surfacing uh, some of their materials for the use of our scholars and our services? Here's some case studies that illustrate some of these principles. Uh, first of all, uh, for digitization, Stanford maintains a program that is both broad and deep. We do digitization for a number of reasons. Uh, part of it is collection development. In many cases, we cannot acquire physical items, but we can acquire them digitally or through their digital facsimiles. Uh, digital access also provides new forms of scholarship and availability to scholars and researchers anywhere in the world 24 by 7. Finally, preservation is one of the main reasons we digitize, especially when physical artifacts uh, may be uh, deteriorating or otherwise at risk at the more they're used. And again, uh, emphasizing all formats, we look at 3D digitization, born digital uh, materials, such as legacy computer, um, computer software and files from say the 1980s, the 1990s, or even the last decade. Uh, we have a major program around imaging, uh, maps, and Mike has shown several examples of uh, time-based media, audio, video, film. Uh, one of the major parts of our infrastructure, and I, I think actually the heart of Stanford's digital library, is the Stanford Digital Repository. In many ways, this is like the stacks or the digital stacks of, uh, of a library, just the way the physical library is filled with shelves. These are our digital shelves. And in this one system, uh, we store the amalgamated information uh, that we've highlighted. We've been running the Stanford Digital Repository for almost 15 years now. It has approaching one petabyte of materials, more than 2,300 collections, uh, and two million digital objects. Emphasizing the role of the library and its service as a, um, the full life cycle of information, of information, we have more than 1,500 depositors coming from 45 different academic departments at Stanford who have put their materials into the Stanford Digital Repository for access via the library. And the main services that we look at are, are the management of these assets, the ability to preserve them for future scholarship, and of course, the ability to provide access. Uh, I'm just underscoring that digital preservation is still a fundamental role of libraries, even in the digital realm. Um, uh, on the book on the left is the Doomsday Book, uh, which William the Conqueror uh, produced after he con conquered, uh, came from Normandy and conquered England in 1066. This was a census of his new lands um, to indicate the wealth and the, and the distribution of assets uh, across the land. It's still legible today, nearly 900 years later, or more than 900 years later. On the right is uh, an early version of an iPad. Look how big the bezel is and um, uh, an early version of its bookstore. Which of these will still be legible in a thousand years? The, the Doomsday Book almost certainly will be if you can read um, uh, the Anglo-Saxon or the Norse or the Latin, whatever it's written in. The iPad uh, is probably about 10 years old now and can't be read without specialist software. A major area of focus for Stanford uh, is research and the production of research data. Therefore, in support of that scholarship, the library is tacking heavily into supporting research data and research data services. At the libraries, we have developed a number of specialist data repositories and services. Uh, we are actively developing integration with high performance computing environments so that data that is produced from those computing environments can be managed and accessed via the library. We're also building pathways from the library to these HPC environments so they can take data from our collections and compute upon them. We also have the information experts that Mike mentioned at the beginning uh, are quite active in acquiring data, consulting on data, how to manage the data, how best to access it, and increasingly for research data, uh, sophisticated agreements about uh, what is allowed and possible to, um, in terms of data use, especially regarding uh, the fundamental concerns of privacy and information security. 
One of the major foc focal points for data services uh, now is the reproducibility of science. This is a fundamental tenet of scholarly uh, production and communication is that others should be able to replicate your research. Uh, if the research data and the software that's used to produce that are only available to the original scientists in their labs, that's not possible. Therefore, a major role of the Stanford Digital Repository is to take in both the, the data and the software that these scientists use and make them available to other scholars. Uh, this is a case study from Professor Susan Holmes, who is a professor of statistics at Stanford, who makes use of the repository and deposits religiously all of the artifacts from her research. Another major trend that we're focused on is uh, ac public access to research data. Increasingly in the United States and also in Europe, uh, in fact, Europe is a bit ahead of the United States in this front, um, funding agencies and governments are requiring that researchers who receive uh, public funding monies make the outputs of their scholarship accessible. And uh, you may have heard the phrase that oil um, is, or data is the new oil for the 21st century. Uh, we regard da research data as the primary, uh, the primary source materials for 21st century research. And as such, we want to be able to bring that material in and make it available to future scholars. Part of this is also not just data that's produced at the university, but increasingly aggressive acquisition of data from the open web and from suppliers. So we bring in uh, digital monographs. These might be single form PDFs or office documents uh, from uh, across the web. We also uh, increasingly acquire licensed content. And when we do that, we do it with a provision that we can do text and data mining on it locally. So our readers can't just read it, they can, our scholars can also mine it. Finally, we think of the web as a primary form of scholarly communications and cultural expression for the 21st century. And we're actively capturing websites as part of our collection development. I mentioned that libraries are increasingly becoming um, not just repositories, but almost publication agents. One of the major services that we offer to Stanford University is the ability to capture electronic theses and dissertations to preserve them and make them available to the world. This is actually one of the most highly used digital collections at Stanford. Um, and uh, about 8% of the searches of the Stanford catalog are for Stanford uh, dissertations or theses. We've been running this service for 10 years now, and uh, we now have over 10,000 theses and dissertations. It's one of our most highly sought after and highly appreciated services that we provide. Mike mentioned IIIF, or the International Image Interoperability Framework. This is another case study which we believe is an incredible synthesis of community plus technology uh, plus scholarly use. IIIF allows for the deep inspection, analysis, and collaborative use of images on the web through a common set of APIs. This is an example from the National Gallery of Art, and they produced uh, incredibly high resolution scans of their collections, and they've put these online with IIIF. Um, you can see some of the controls that you can inspect this Van Gogh painting, uh, including incredibly deep zoom, uh, analytic tools such as uh, recoloring the image in the browser, uh, and you can zoom in to the degree where you can again see the individual brush strokes. We often think of paintings as two-dimensional, but true connoisseurs and uh, historians of art know, in fact, as this picture shows, that they're in fact three-dimensional. And you can get a sense of the actual uh, tools that Van Gogh used as he produced this. IIIF also allows the use of both open source and proprietary tools to do image comparison. This is an example from the Welcome Library and the Welcome Collection in the United Kingdom with computed tomography scans of the head of a seal. Using IIIF, you can bring up a side-by-side -side comparison of two different images of the seal and zoom them to different levels, inspect them, and of course, annotate them. IIIF also allows the ability to bring together digital facsimiles from different institutions and unite items that belong together either logically or physically. Sometime after this French manuscript was produced in the 15th century, a collector came through and uh, ripped out the pretty picture. 
the picture or the miniature, as it's called in manuscript studies, uh, is in the collections of the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. They digitized it and put it online. The, the remainder of the page or the folio is in the collections of a different institution. They have also digitized that and put them online. These two things obviously go together. And with the power of IIIF and digital library technology, it's actually possible to reunite digitally this uh, item, which was uh, once an uh, integral whole physically. This is an example of the Biblissima project, which is now part of the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, where they've unified digitally this collection. Uh, the wonderful thing about this is not only is the picture back in its page, if you turn the page over, the text on the facing page is also there and you can once again read the original text. Uh, scientific analysis, uh, whether it's in uh, science, technology, engineering, or math, or um, whether it's for art, is also possible with IIIF and digital library technologies. Here's an example of studying Vermeer's Girl with the Red Hat, another example from the National Gallery of Art, where, the, where they've done multispectral imaging on this to understand uh, its internal structure and how the painting was actually made through uh, viewing radiograph composition in an infrared views of the image, you can actually get a sense of the thickness of the paint and even the underlying frame. Finally, Mike showed an example of annotation with a digital medieval manuscript. Here's an annotation or set of annotations that's used for teaching. This is from Harvard University with their Cell Explorer and for their massively online open source or open courseware, they produced this incredibly high resolution image of a cell and they've annotated the different parts so you can zoom in to different parts uh, and different scales of a cell and understand what its biological componentry is. Uh, this has been used in their online courses as, and is a core part of their software. All of these examples come from the collaboration of hundreds of institutions across the world. Uh, that they are collaborating not only on open source software, but also on open content. The top graph here shows a heat map for Mirador, the comparative viewer that was used in many of the examples that Mike and I have both used. Stanford University originally developed this viewer, uh, later joined by Harvard University. But since then, we've seen contributions in use literally from uh, almost every continent. Uh, as you can see from red spots showing uh, quite heavy usage and green spots showing lighter usage. Uh, the, the red pins on the map show all the institutions across the world which have so far that we know of engaged with IIIF. We would welcome more pins in India. Um, one of the final examples is uh, of collaboration and digital library access is the Digital Library of the Middle East. This is a project where Stanford is proud to serve as a technology partner and is being led by uh, CLEAR, the Council of Library and Information Resources in the United States, and now the Qatar National Library. Um, this is developed to be a global digital library focused on the cultural heritage and research materials on, by, and for the citizens of the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, there's actually no single repository for this material. Instead, we're drawing content from dozens of repositories across the world that have digitized their Middle Eastern collections and put them online. The Digital Library of the Middle East is using some of this open source software to collect these records, bring them into a single interface, and then through technologies such as IIIF and digital facsimiles, make them available to scholars anywhere in the world. One of the most important byproducts of this is not only access to the scholarship, but the strong network of uh, international libraries that are working together in this collaborative effort. The last thing I want to talk about uh, is artificial intelligence. Mike gave a great demonstration of some of the um, almost futuristic capabilities that are possible with UNO and the conceptual search engine. We believe that artificial intelligence is going to fundamentally transform and elevate the work of libraries, archives, and museums. Um, based on this, with our partners at the National Library of Norway, the Smithsonian Institute, the British Library, and the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, we have formed an international uh, network of libraries, archives, and museums to identify best practices, exchange best practices, exchange algorithms, and also serve as a, a training ground for our various staff and on models. 
So this is an international participatory community. It's quite exciting because um, we know the future for AI is uh, much longer than the past of AI. And by getting in at this relatively early stage, we feel that not only can we benefit it from artificial intelligence, we can help shape it. Um, if you would like to join in uh, to these activities, it's a, again, a global effort, and we would welcome participants and contributors from India. If you go to HTTPS, uh, AIforlam.org, you'll find more information. And thank you very much. I think we now have some time for uh, Q&A. Before we start the Q&A, I see a lot of questions about uh, sharing the talk today. So after the webinar ends, all the participants will be sent a video link of the entire webinar. So I'll get to the questions now. What I will do is I'll combine a few questions because I see a lot of common themes being repeated. So I'll begin with the first question, which is mainly about setting up digital libraries in rural areas and also setting it up in schools. The questions are related in terms of um, how do you set up digital libraries where you, have, where you have limited funding and limited manpower? So this is a very good question and rather important one. One approach could be indeed to try to set up digital libraries in remote places, small villages and so forth. However, it might be more efficient and in a way more powerful to have the possibility of setting up digital libraries that are built and managed centrally and provided to these folks through better telecommunications. Building the telecommunications network in general would benefit these remote places, I think, including by way of providing access to digital libraries. In addition to the technology and the content, however, these digital libraries, as in the case of Stanford and, and as it will be in the Geo Institute, must have knowledgeable subject specialists who are ready to interact with people who have questions, people who need a little bit of help, people who uh, maybe need to have a different language uh, uh, so that they can understand better what's going on. I think it's possible to do this more easily by building a central capacity or central capacities than trying to build something in each remote location. This is an example of what we might call an effective and efficient application of assets to benefit the bootstrapping of not just remote areas, but perhaps a whole nation. Uh, the next question is from Professor J.P. Gupta of Shivnadar University. So he asks, and I quote, since hardware changes every few years, it is likely that digital setup of today may not be supported after a decade or two. Would that require redoing the whole records on the new hardware or software? Uh, no, it doesn't. As a matter of fact, we very specifically choose uh, data formats uh, that are well known and well supported and used uh, pretty much universally, although we are migrating from the US MARC format that has now been used around the world to this linked data approach. The data itself can be will be interacting with various systems as they develop over the time and over the years. The, uh, the other thing to say is, of course, that we try to choose and build software that is easily updated and modular. So if one module begins to get a little bit out of date, we can easily switch in either a new module or easily update uh, a module that we test before we bring it into the main system. We are very much building for the future and we are very much building for this sense of modularity, interoperability, and data that will be used in various ways. Indeed, the presentation that you've seen today has come out through the HT, uh, HTML5 version, which makes this presentation visible on smartphones, as well as tablets, as well as laptops, as well as on desktops. That's an example of preparing for the future and a widening future for very many people around the globe. Mike, if I can just add to that, um, we actually plan that all of our hardware and all of our software will be disposable. Um, we don't expect anything that we're building today will actually be running in uh, 20 years, probably not even 10 years. So we plan for active and continuous replacement of all of the components of the digital library. And when you sign up to be a library, that is the work that, that we commit to doing. At the same time, all of the data is meant to be durable. 
So the, the metadata, the digitized assets, uh, all the digital facsimiles, those are things that we commit to preserving through this handoff of uh, building new software and migration to new systems um, uh, every handful of years. Uh, Tom, would you explain the concept of Perl, please? Yeah, uh, a, per, a Perl is a persistent URL, so P-U-R-L. And uh, one of the main parts, one of the main uh, parts of scholarship actually is that you can uh, cite objects and you can go back to the original source and see what was there. Since we know technology changes uh, every handful of years but citations need to be essentially permanent, um, we've built a system called Perl and you can uh, see if you go to SearchWorks uh, for any digital asset you'll find a perl.stanford.edu link in the record. We commit to maintaining um, a, a persistent splash page for that object where you can find its metadata and you can find a digital facsimile no matter what the technology is. So if you go to a Perl page at Stanford today and you go back in 20 years, you'll find that same asset. The technology and the presentation may be different, but the intellectual content will be the same. So uh, there are a lot of questions also on the technical aspects of the software that is being used by digital libraries. So I have a number of questions which are asking whether it's a free or a paid software. There are questions around the GIS tool that's being used for locating library items and also about the integrated learning management systems being used. So if you could throw some light on these aspects as well. <laughs> that's a very big subject. <laughs> Tom, take a crack at it, please. <laughs> sure. Um, for our physical library, uh, we use uh, Symphony, uh, which is a system from Circe Dynex. It's, it's one of the vendors. Uh, we've been using Symphony for almost um, 20 years now. Uh, we do have our eye, I must admit, on some of the open source uh, software developments in this area. Um, so Koha, of course, is, is quite popular worldwide. We're also looking at Folio in the United States uh, as, a, as a next generation um, library management system. Almost everything that you've seen in terms of the digital library is done with open source software. Um, we realized about 12 years ago that the commercial systems um, were a little bit behind actually some of the functionality that we wanted to see and weren't, weren't giving us the functionalities we wanted. So uh, the main system that we use for discovery is Blacklight. Uh, that's what powers our catalog. And uh, there are uh, extensions of Blacklight called Spotlight, Neo Blacklight, and now even Arclight, which uh, do ex not only let you search your digital repository for your catalog, the geographic information systems, or archives, or build virtual exhibits. Uh, if you go to projectblacklight.org, you'll see an example of this. For Let me suggest that this is a, such a complex topic that the time will come when we are we might present a kind of seminar uh, that will take days, that will present to uh, participants all of what we're doing and all of what others are doing in a way to spread more broadly the details, the possibilities, the questions about continuity across time and across systems. Uh, this would be something that would be um, done by Stanford and our colleagues at GEO and colleagues from other places, the British Library, the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, the, De the National Diet Library in Tokyo, uh, the National Institute for Informatics in Tokyo, et cetera. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe this will happen, but we have so many systems, it's hard to describe all the interactions and all the systems in a short Q&A. And I'd like us to get some more Qs so we can give you some more As. Okay, so I'll quickly go to the next question. Um, how, how do you take care of customer experience in a digital library environment? So let me say that first of all, we listen very carefully to our patrons and we try to understand them very carefully. We have about 40 people in, who are subject specialists who are responsible for interacting with the departments, the academic departments at Stanford and understanding in great detail their research and instruction programs. That feedback helps us understand how we, what we might build, how we might build, and what we acquire. In addition, those people, along with all the rest of us, try to acquire materials and systems and build systems that anticipate need, that are not merely responsive to need. Finally, I would say we are always interested in hearing how our systems are working. So you will find on the Stanford website for the libraries, 
a feedback button so we can hear from people all the time about their experiences. We always use focus groups and we sometimes uh, use uh, surveys. Not, not very often, I must confess, but we do use surveys. And finally, we employ um, user experience professionals on our staff who are very attentive and are constantly surfing around the entire web to understand what are the features and functions and the presentation methods and modes that are most powerfully used in support of readers, in support of instructors, in support of students. Tom, anything further? Yeah, I, uh, I would just underline uh, what you said. Every single page on the library website and every one of our apps, there is a, a submit feedback form. We read and analyze every bit of feedback that comes in. We respond to most of it, but not all of it. Some, some things you don't uh, need to respond to on the internet. Um, and every time we build a new application or enhance it, we look at that as a knowledge base of how we could do a better job serving our patrons and our scholars' needs. So Professor Savitra Sirohi asks that how one should go about creating the conceptual search device in terms of how should one organize the data, how do we create the concept map, and what kind of open source technology may be used? I have to tell you that there is no open source technology in that uh, service that you saw from UNO. In fact, there are about 52 algorithms. Uh, there are about 100 patents that have been de delivered to UNO with regard to their functions. It's very complicated. You start with the full text, or at least a very good meta record that has an abstract as well as the title, the author's names, and um, the, uh, the publication information. It's, um, it's, it is a, a process that involves a lot of ingestion, and then um, what, is, what amounts to detailed analysis. It's quite different than Google Scholar. Google Scholar is based on keywords and key phrases, but when you get a result from the Google Scholar file, which must be billions of entries large, they've only indexed the text. And if you don't know anything about the subject that you're searching, you may get millions of hits and basically no way other than date ranges to break down that result into something that is relevant to you and really understandable to you much of what you saw in our um, demonstration of our online catalog articles plus and you know is based on a different conception and that conception is let's find some ways in the case of the keyword and key searching elements namely the the online catalog at stanford and the articles plus at stanford to reduce large sets to smaller more comprehensive uh, comprehensible ones in the case of you know they have an enormous number of concepts, but you could see how easy it was for me to navigate through those concepts in part using the graphical user interface, the, the visualization of those concepts. It's not easy to do, and there is no open source that I know of in that realm. Okay, there are also a number of questions related to intellectual property. Uh, specifically on how does a digital library acquire old manuscripts licensing without violation of copyright and IPR? Okay, so let's make it something very clear. It is not the case that ancient manuscripts, ancient, rare books published before 1826, are copyright in their original form. They may have access rights that are governed by the institutions that hold them. And the wonderful magic of the IIIF community and relationships is that the institutions, art institutions, uh, archives, libraries, are making their findings, their holdings accessible by way of digital avatars through downstreaming, not downloading. And this means that the individual institution can retain the ability to, to, to limit access to the very image uh, of whatever it is in the way of a piece of art or a book or a manuscript uh, page. They are not giving that away. And if you want to make use of such a, an image, you must apply to the institution to ask for permission to use it in a publication. So there is no co copyright in that. With regard to the other elements that you have seen, the modern articles, the modern books that we've shown you, 
we license those uh, articles through uh, licenses with publishers and copyright holders so the Stanford community can read them. If you were to go to the St Stanford Library's website, which I encourage, you'll be able to search and discover items of interest. But without a Stanford ID, you may note that I had to log in into my account, which identified me to the, to the service as a member of the Stanford community. Uh, without that identification, you cannot see what you have found. You're going to have to go to find it, uh, use it in a different fashion than coming to the Stanford website. So the big notion there is that you, in, in one case, there is good access that allows lots of functions through the IIIF interface. But in modern works, under current copyright laws in, in many our, of our nations, you, one has to have a license. One has to go negotiate a license. And indeed, if you look carefully at that original page that I showed you with the image of our, the front of our main library, you will have seen that we have 10 million physical books, two and a half million e-books, and about 67,000 uh, e-subscriptions to journals, et cetera, et cetera. All of those that are modern involve a license that we pay for, for the Stanford community, which is about 2,500 faculty members, about 18,000 students, including graduates and professional students, and about 20,000 other people on campus in our hospitals, in our clinics, etc., who have uh, access to that material through our uh, licenses, which we negotiate very carefully. Uh, the next question is from uh, Professor K. Rama Patnaik, who is a librarian from IIM Bangalore. So he asks that as regards to the preservation of locally digitized content, how do we overcome the challenge of obsolescence of formats? There are no open source solutions to this issue. So what is the way out here? So what we do is to um, capture images and store them in several different ways. We start by capturing them on high resolution TIFFs. We save those TIFFs. We then convert them in various ways so they can be transmitted more quickly to end users. Those, those resolutions in, in GIFs and JPEGs and so forth and, and MPEGs get stored as well. And they will be upgraded over time by the automated uh, systems changes that are inherent in our Stanford Digital Repository. So there's a kind of tracking mechanism that in most cases predict permits algorithmic alterations to fundamental formats. We always put those into our Stanford Digital Repository, which has been in digital tape and spinning uh, magnetic media, but now is going to the clouds. And we expect not only to have our saved data from the Stanford Digital Repository, which is both a digital archive and a digital repository, a host for seeing some of these materials, we will be not only storing in the cloud, but we will be computing in the cloud as well. This suggests an order of magnitude of activity that can be supported only by very large and, and institutions that have made a significant uh, investment in their systems and services. Tom, anything further from you? Uh, the one thing where I think format obsolescence is going to provide the most interesting challenge and maybe the best opportunities is around our, our born digital forensics lab. So basically mm. digital archaeology. Good point. Um, we actually are not interested in migrating uh, older computer files from the 90s. We want to be able to see them in their original form uh, because that, that's as much as a part of it as the intellectual content. And we're increasingly looking at emulation as a standard technology to um, basically reestablish these legacy computing platforms and see what it was like to uh, be on a computer in the 90s. I'm going to take another question from the same individual. So he asks that given the lower attention span of individuals due to devices, new models of instruction or maybe AI-assisted discovery holds the key for retaining attention. Library technologies are unable to provide the experience and popularity to many apps that drive consumerism. So what is the future of searching and discovery? The future of searching and discovery is partly based on what you have seen, partly based on new uh, AI approaches, and partly based, I think, much more extensively on the use of RDF triples uh, and linked open data. 
those will permit new kinds of discovery, discovery of new kinds of relationships among ideas and objects and places and people and so forth. Uh, I believe that all of that is going to be possible and indeed we're working in all of those realms. And as you can see, we're also licensing from those realms and getting experience. And indeed the you know uh, company was given a greenhouse year in our main library in order for the brilliant man who invented all that to interact with all of our staff as he wished to understand metadata better, to understand user experience better, in general to gain experience that helped him shape the company that he has created. There are hundreds of institutions that are making use of UNO right now, and they're gaining a lot of experience and gaining more and more full text. I think right now they're running about 300 or 500 million texts that they're analyzing. Ultimately, they will be able to analyze data sets, images, and so forth. So it's, it's not, um, it is not as challenging as you think, as long as we can see these advances being made somewhere and somehow gain some understanding and or access to make use of them and thus provide more services, more content, more possibilities for discovery and research through our, through our good thinking and our good works. I'm going to take a few broader questions now. So the first being in terms of doing um, a cost benefit analysis, can you share the challenges faced during the Stanford Digital Library project? <laughs> well, first, the, the first thing that you all have to understand is that many of us have been digi digital for a very long time. When I entered the profession following my work uh, on a PhD program in musicology, historical musicology in 1970, I was thrown immediately into a digital world. So I've been a digital guy from 1970. Many of my younger colleagues, including especially Tom, was basically raised as a digerati. And our, we've trained our staff and we've given our staff both challenges, opportunities, and rewards for becoming digital. And the process of bringing these people, all of the staff, 420 people, into the digital world started in 1993 by giving every one of them access to a computer or their own computer, and then responsibilities for, uh, in the case of those who make selections, for selecting not just from the physical manifestations of books, but to the digital manifestations of books. In our view, a book is a book, whether it's bits and bytes or ink on paper. And that goes for the whole realm of objects that are useful for research, for teaching, and for items that are part of our cultural heritage, whether as digital avatars or original digital items, to be stored, to be made accessible over the generations and centuries for use and reuse by succeeding generations. It's an important concept, but you have to start by insisting that everyone become digital and helping them do that. So we'll take the last couple of questions now. So the first one is uh, in terms of disruptions in uh, teaching and pedagogy, what would be the transformational role that librarians can play in the future teaching process? So it's the same as it's always been. Instructors who are aware that they are in effect not just teaching their subject, but they're teaching methods of thought. They're teaching judgment. They're teaching a hunger for exploration. And that is done in part through exploring library assets that are available and not just local library assets. With the advent of the World Wide Web in the early 90s, it quickly became possible to see what was going on in the way of intellectual activity through published reports, I admit, in the early days, in many different places and in many different brains. That sense of exploration, of discovery, of the application of judgment, often transmitted by the instructor, sometimes transmitted by the librarians who help students in doing problem sets, in writing research, in performing research, leads to a lifelong capacity for discovery and really the joy of discovery. And then the application of wisdom and knowledge and information to their daily lives, to their company's needs, to their family's needs, and ultimately to their national needs. This whole realm has to do with the really enthusiasm for searching, for understanding, and for understanding across our cultural borders, which may be very narrowly, very narrowly confined 
to across the whole world. And I will tell you, it's my view that it is important for the world to understand one another much better than we do and to figure out how better to get along with one another in less competitive ways and that are ways that are more focused on how we can save planet Earth from whatever it is that we're doing that makes it a more difficult place for us to live and to be happy. Sorry for the little, little announcement there. If I can jump in on that. Sorry, the, so John, go on. Uh, sorry, sometime. Uh, the, um, th there's some questions. This is a common refrain or a common question that comes up. Uh, what is the future of librarians in a digital realm? I think the need for librarians is greater than ever. There is more information than ever, and it's actually getting harder and harder to navigate and find what you may need. You can always find something, but what you may need is a different question. Librarians are the experts in that, and if access to information is a, um, access to education uh, is essential at human rights and civil rights, I think librarians are gonna play an increasingly essential role in the future. We've seen brand new uh, disciplines open up. We have data curators, we have data scientists, we have data librarians, uh, and the ability to connect people with the information services that they need is, uh, that job hasn't changed. It's just becoming more important. So we have time for one last question, and this is something I've been getting on emails also from a number of participants. So we have a lot of participants who are junior librarians who've just entered the profession. So the question is around what are the key skills that a librarian should possess at the beginning of his career? So the questions have come from a lot of people who've just started their career and would want to know like what, how should they grow in the profession and how should they develop themselves? So wonderful question. And of course, we're very uh, much involved in the sorts of educational experiences, mentoring, and then the presentation of what we do in some, in some manner, how we do it, so that people get some ideas about what might be their special interest. I think the first and most important thing is that one has to become quite expert in one domain or another of librarianship. Could be collection development in a particular domain. In my life, it was musicology and music. I was a performer, I was a scholar, but I quickly learned that my fascination with the cultural interests, the cultural aspects of music uh, uh, went from physics to economic history over the, over the centuries. Other people become expert in a technical realm, acquisitions, negotiation, preservation, including preser preserving physical items and preserving digital information. Yet others become interested in the very technical roles of programming, artificial intelligence. And when you do that, then you start to identify other colleagues around closely, close to you and more distant from you and find ways much more easy now than it was 20 years ago to interact with those people and to continue developing your skills but also developing your community. Finally, it's very important to be in a place where you can get mentoring from more senior colleagues, from faculty members, from students who have enjoyed and used your advice and your products, your knowledge, or who come back to you over the years to interact with you. You can learn from them too. And then one has to be ready in many cases to apply for jobs, to put yourself out, to look to perhaps to moving to a different place, to work with different people, to find new opportunities in other related fields like publishing, like the support of libraries using software from vendors who create the software. There are various ways that you have to go about building a career. And I think each professional finds their way through a kind of thicket of possibilities, but you have to be ready to sacrifice a bit to make some progress. And you have to be ready to present yourself through publications and presentations, through community interactions, not necessarily in person, thanks to the various means that we have, including this very presentation that we're made, making, to make yourself where, uh, known to others who might be interested in attracting you as a talent. Thank you, sir. So there are a number of more questions that I see, but unfortunately we do not have enough time. So what I can ask all the participants is all of you have my email address. So please email your questions and we'll see if we can get them answered in due course. I'd like to request Dr. Kalashkovich to deliver the concluding remarks. 
so thank you uh, sanchan and i would like to uh, thank mike and tom both uh, this is a wonderful session and we always believe uh, you know building a world class university's foundation lies on every bit and piece of a university to become an excellence oriented and uh, you know we could not have a better uh, speaker today then mike and tom who can reflect the excellence in the library science and library profession uh, and we value the library and library professional all who have joined today and you know building a good university required a very good discovery and research ability which can only be provided through a wonderful and very digi digital oriented libraries today even in the time of covid 19 where the entire india is moving towards a digital education it is also important digital education only be complemented with the digital library to ensure that there is a better outcome of it with that perspective also digital library subject was very relevant and that's how we requested dr mike keller and tom kramer to brief today with a case study of stanford university mike and tom again thank you it's a wonderful presentation and demonstration i'm sure lot of people more we have more than 1200 people were uh, us online those who have really could get definitely a best of the understanding of the digital library and the all the technologies that is prevailing and and the scope and the possibilities today and we would continue to do such seminar which will help india's higher education system and help the higher education system to transform in a time to come thank you all thank you very much Thank you all too very much. We we very much enjoyed being part of this session. It's a pleasure. Thank you.